welcome everyone. Uh, so this year we're continuing the base up speaker series, and we're very honored to have our first speaker, Professor uh, Philip Hennig, speaking today. Uh, so Philip holds the chair for the methods of machine learning at the University of Tübingen, and he is also an adjunct senior research scientist at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems. Uh, so throughout my research career, I always see Philip as one of the, well, if not the most iconic researchers in populist numerics. So this is not only because of his seminal work in the field, but also his leading role in the community. And I'm really happy that he's with us today. And without further ado, let's welcome Philip. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, uh, and thanks a lot for this very kind introduction. I'm uh, very happy to be here. Let me uh, start by, first of all, apologizing that I'm in a somewhat unprofessional setup. I usually do these talks from a more or less, uh, a much better setup in my office, but I'm at home today because I have a sick child at home. Uh, the other thing I should say is that, so when he invited me to give this talk, this was at a back school workshop that I was organizing a while ago, I said, um, so my understanding is that everyone here in this call, or at least like the, the expected person participating in this call is an expert on Bayesian optimization. And I really haven't worked in Bayesian optimization for the past, well, decade or so. Um, but so this talk is not going to be about Bayesian optimization as such, but it's going to be about what I think people working in Bayesian optimization should really be working on, which is a superset, in my opinion, of Bayesian optimization. So what, the reason why I say this is that so to me, Bayesian optimization experts are first and foremost Gaussian process modeling experts. So maybe they're probabilistic modeling experts and in particular Gaussian process experts. So if I show to a group of like, like you, oh, and hi, Zubin. If I show a, a, a group of you a, a, a slide like this, then within seconds, everyone knows what's going on here. You know what kind of model I'm using. You probably know what kind of kernel I've used to build this Gaussian process, what kind of likelihood I use, and what kind of computation I've performed to make this kind of visualization. So to me, vision optimization is about modeling an intractable, a typically deterministic function for some variation of, of deterministic. And um, in modeling this intractable function that is deterministic with a probabilistic, or if you like the word, stochastic model like a Gaussian process. And then refining that model over time so that it becomes a better uh, representation of the problem in an active kind of fashion. And so this description, notice that this description didn't really involve the word optimization. What I, what I said, but like the whole process that you probably spent most of your time with is for, 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 for this process, the, the optimization aspect is more like a specific of the task that you're actually trying to address in the end. And what I'd like to convince you of today is that you can use the same techniques, the same understanding, the same machinery to apply uh, to apply it to basically all of the numerical problems of machine learning. So what are the numerical problems of machine learning? Why do I say this? Well, actually, in my opinion, machine learning really is entirely numerical problems. So and a learning machine is a computer program that refines a model through data. But that's a nice fancy word that we you know, tell to the media. But what actually happens on the computer, the thing that the learning machine actually does is the solution of a numerical problem. And in the contrast, so what I mean by numerical problem is that in, in contrast to classic AI, where the computations were typically tractable because the problems, the descriptions were discrete, the, um, in contemporary machine learning, the computations are intractable in the sense that you're trying to compute the solution to a mathematical problem that has no closed form answer. They are integration problems or Bayesian inference. They are optimization problems. And here we go with the word optimization to fit estimators and also you know to find best choices for some modeling tasks they are simulation problems so the solution of differential equations to predict what's going to happen next so any system that interacts with the world has to solve such a problem and they are linear algebra tasks because linear algebra is the base case of everything there are like the special cases of gaussian integrals quadratic optimization problems linear differential equations and for all of these tasks long before bayesian optimization we already have tools available, tools that arrive in our community through toolboxes. So they get introduced um, to, to us, like basically as, so as kind of time capsules that arrive from decades ago, 
when they were invented as, as tools to solve the similar kind of numerical problems, but for different communities, for applied physics, for example, for engineering. And that's very convenient for us as a community because they arrive as these nice little Python or Julia toolboxes. And so everyone can use them right out of the box without having to fiddle with them. That may, may save a lot of time. But what I'm going to argue now is that actually these package solutions, they don't really address all of the challenges well that we have in contemporary machine learning because these numerical tasks, even though the words are the same as in the classic setting, they really mean a slightly different thing or the challenges in them are slightly different now in machine learning than they used to be um, a few decades ago in other fields. So what do I mean by that? There are basically three things that distinguish the numerical computations of machine learning from those of fields that came before it. It's first of all, so maybe one way to think about this is that the, the generic machine learning problem these days is empirical risk minimization. So think of training a deep neural network. There is some function that, we, that depends on some parameters. Those might be the weights of the network. We want to optimize this function. We want to find a minimum, or maybe we want to treat this as a log likelihood and sample from it um, to construct some approximate posterior. So these loss functions, they tend to have this kind of convenient form. They are a sum over individual terms where each term depends on one datum and on all the parameters of the model. So now here are our three problems. If the treat is as an optimization problem, first of all, these tasks are extremely high dimensional. So theta tends to be a vector of size, whatever the machine provides as memory. So this is maybe not, this doesn't seem like a major problem because there were numerical algorithms before that are very high, that operate in high dimensional problems, but it's kind of a, a technical challenge in the sense that if you have, if, you are, if your field kind of pushes you to use a parameter vector of size, whatever is the available budget, then you can't really do much bookkeeping. You can't, for example, keep around several of these vectors in memory to do some statistics on them, to you know, observe changes over time, for example. That's maybe not so much of a huge problem, but it exists. But um, really the biggest challenge, in my opinion, is that what people actually do when you run an optimizer on such a problem is of course, and I'm not telling you anything new here, is that you're not actually computing this quantity properly. So when your optimizer asks for a gradient, you're not going through the whole data set to compute like the gradient of every individual term in this big sum, but instead you subsample, you draw some IID batches from the whole data set, and compute a mini batch estimator of the gradient or of the loss function or whatever you want or the curvature and so on. So what that gives you is a random variable that is an estimator of the thing we're trying to compute. And if you manage to draw IID from the, from the full distribution, then it's actually an unbiased estimator. And maybe because this is a sum of IID random variables, if we want to be a little bit daring, we could hope that it might be approximately Gaussian distributed. Maybe it isn't, but you know, on, in the limit of a relatively large batch, it's approximately Gaussian distributed. So what that really means is that instead of computing a deterministic quantity, instead of doing what the, the, the numerical algorithms of the past expected us to do, what our computations return are actually random variables. Random variables that are distributed around the thing we're trying to compute, but with a really non-trivial disturbance perturbation. So this variance here, or let's say the standard deviation, the square root of this variance in deep learning, for example, is typically of the same size or larger than the signal we're trying to compute. And that means that the classic mathematical theory of numerical analysis doesn't really apply anymore. So the classic kind of modus operandi of, of, uh, of numerical analysis is that you're trying to find an, a, a, like an algorithm that you know, solves your numerical task. And then you do some stability analysis. So you say, oh, so what if the computer doesn't actually compute the quantity it's supposed to compute, but the number we get out is perturbed by a small amount relative to the actual number, then what happens to this perturbation? Does it get like, amplified or can it like decay away? But this, this assumption that, that the disturbance is small relative to the signal is just patently wrong in contemporary machine learning. Instead, we are actually computing random variables. And that means that in my opinion, we really need algorithms that treat the computation specifically as you know, operating on quantities that are fundamentally probabilistic. And before I get to how we're going to address that, let me point out a third challenge, which is that the, the way we do, we use numerical algorithms in machine learning at the moment is typically not anymore that we just solve one compartmentalized, unique, like separate problem, and then we're done. 
Instead, we're building complicated software solutions that provide, that use pipelines of data and different sources of information and combine them in various complicated ways to produce basically a product. And in the process of doing so, we call all sorts of numerical algorithms in, in like out of order, maybe, right? Such, such that um, these like different sources of information and the different errors of these numerical algorithms interact with each other. So that may sound like a little bit abstract. Let me give you a concrete example of what such a problem may look like. And it's a very much, actually, it's a 2021 problem. I would like to say it's not a 2022 problem anymore, but maybe it's a problem that's on everyone's mind. So you've seen curves like this before. This is the um, corona case count in Germany from 2020 to the middle of 2021. And this is a typical kind of maybe simple data analysis problem. So here is a very, like, weakly speaking, here is a curve. And the obvious question you have is how does it continue to the right, right? Because, you know, politicians want to know, we all want to know. So if you wanted to solve this problem with a generic black box machine learning algorithm, if you train a deep neural network on it, like it's a bit silly with a one dimensional curve like this, if you try and train a Gaussian process on it, it's very hard to extrapolate meaningfully, right? Because if you use the stationary kernel, you're just going to get a really boring extrapolation, a linear one or a constant one, or one that decays to zero if you extrapolate. That's not going to work well. Alternatively, we could use a mechanistic model, one that's informed by the physics of the, of the problem. So we could write down a variant of these like SIR type models, which describe the population in terms of people that are susceptible, infected, recovered, vaccinated, or dead and you move from one of these compartments to the other according to some process. So the problem with this is that here we have a differential equation, but we don't know anything about it. There are some unknown parameters inside of it. Like, for example, this contact rate that tells you how, like, with, with which probability or with which rate people move from susceptible to infected. It has something to do with how often people interact with each other. You can think of this as a hyperparameter in a, a modeling task. And in fact, I'm going to tell you in a moment that you should think of it as a hyperparameter. But really, it's something that enters into this numerical chain of computation in a complicated fashion. And so we would ideally like to like, combine those two. We can't run an ODE solver without knowing what beta is. And we can't, we can't infer what beta is without an ODE solver. So we'll need a way of combining these two sources of information, a mechanistic one and a, let's say, empirical data-driven one together into one solution. And of course, there are ways of doing that, but I'm going to show you one that, in my opinion, is a little bit more flexible and more adapted to the way we do machine learning overall, the more natural way to do this in, within a machine learning framework. So long story short, we need ways of building better numerical algorithms, better computational tools to address these three challenges I outlined, and we could wait for the numerical analysts to come around and do research programs on how to address this. And maybe actually they already do to some degree. Um, but I think we don't have to wait for that. And people like you who are experts in, in like, Bayesian modeling, in Gaussian process modeling, in um, you know, like, building numerical algorithms already are based on a machine learning language are really the right people to work in this domain. Why? Because numerical algorithms already are learning machines. A numerical algorithm is an algorithm that estimates an unknown quantity given the result of a, given the observation of a tractable quantity. It's a, an algorithm that estimates, let's say, an integral by evaluating the integrand various times at various locations. Or, in fact, if you think in a Bayesian optimization language, it's an algorithm that solves an optimization problem by evaluating maybe the utility function, the, 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 the objective function, or the gradient of the objective function at various points. And so these are algorithms that, that estimate a latent quantity from data. It's just that the data doesn't, in this case, arrive from the hard drive as we are used to. It arrives from the CPU, from the GPU, or a Google from the TPU, I don't know. And so that, that, that distinction between the sources of, of information is very like very minor compared like outside of the machine right it's 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 really just exactly where you get your information from but other than that it's basically the exact same setting and that means we should be able to build numerical algorithms that treat computation as collecting actively collecting information about an unknown quantity and we should be able to phrase these algorithms in the probabilistic language and those are algorithms i like to call probabilistic numerical algorithms
And there's an interesting connection here that it turns out that many of the classic numerical algorithms, the ones that you know from your toolboxes, they can actually be thought of and they are often derived as least squares estimators, as in the non-parametric sense, kernel-rich regression algorithms. Numerical analysis, they won't be called kernel-rich regression, but they basically are. So if you know about the connection between least squares and kernel risk regression and Gaussian process inference, you already know how that story is going to go, how we're going to ex like expand the viewpoint from the classic algorithms to probabilistic numerical algorithms. What I'm going to try and do now is show you an example of how you would do that with a dynamical system. So with simulation, specifically not with optimization. I could have given an entirely different talk and talk about optimization, but I think that would have gone off on a completely different path. Maybe we can discuss this a little bit at the end. So allow me to maybe also to make it a bit more interesting, talk about a task that you may not spend much of your time on, and that's simulation. It's the solution of a differential equation to also connect to this example I just made. So this, what I might mean more specifically, mathematically precisely, is the solution of such an initial value problem. So there is an, an, an ODE, an ordinary differential equation. So we know that there is some unknown curve which happens to have the property that its time derivative is given by some nonlinear function that depends on the curve itself. And we know that this curve goes through some initial point. So it goes through this black dot down here. And then this vector field F is described by this scribble plot in the background. What we'd like to find is this black line that goes, that follows the gradient of this field along the line. And of course, we don't know yet what that line is. I mean, this is a very simplistic example, but you can imagine that this can be quite hard. So, there are algorithms that do that for you. They like, you know, called SciPy ODE int or jax.experimental.ode. And you might think, what, wonder about what these algorithms actually do. If you ignore those algorithms for a moment, I'll tell you how you can think about them as an inference problem. So given that we know that this curve goes to this black point, what we can do is we can evaluate this vector field at that point. That evaluation will give us a, an observation of the gradient of the curve at this point. And we can take a Gaussian process and condition it on the observation of this gradient and the fact that the curve goes through this point. These are two numbers. If you condition our Gaussian process on that, then we're going to get a posterior that like, many of you will immediately kind of understand. And we can use that to extrapolate forward through time through to some next time step. If we uh, do that, then that provides us with an estimate of what the solution might be at some future point. So at that future point, with some uncertainty, we could evaluate the vector field again, get another noisy observation of the gradient, and then we can continue iteratively forward through time, again, um, iterating between evaluating a gradient and observing the, the, the gradient of the vector field at some point to, to extrapolate forward again. And then once you're at the right end of the, of the extrapolation regime, you're basically done, right? Now you have a posterior over what the solution of the ODE might be. And here I've just collected four observations, which is why it's a quite uncertain uh, posterior. So um, if you start, think about what you need to implement such an algorithm, that you'll realize that you need exactly the kind of inputs that you would also give to a classic ODE solver. So instead of calling like one of the classic ODE solvers, like SciPy Integrate Solve IDP, and handling it a handle to the vector field, the domain over which you want to integrate, and the initial value, you could implement the same thing and hide a Gaussian process inside of this kind of code. And that's exactly what we've done. Now, it turns out that there is an entire family of algorithms, which I'm going to tell you more about in a second, which essentially do this basically doing, with, doing Gaussian process inference. And these algorithms happen to inherit many of the classic good properties of the good old you know, uh, ODE solvers. In particular, they have the property that uh, they can be implemented very efficiently at very low cost. I'll tell you in a moment how that's achieved. So they are not typically expensive, they're faster than that. Secondly, they converge efficiently. So in the sense that if you increase the number of steps that the algorithm is allowed to take, if you increase the computational budget, then the red line in this plot converges to the black line at a high polynomial rate in the number of steps. So if you increase the number of steps, the difference between red and black con con converges as some polynomial in the distance between the evaluation points, where the order of the polynomial for the typical ODE solvers you tend to use are four or five or maybe eight if you really push it. It turns out that we can be, they can recover this kind of convergence rate. And then there is a new thing, which is specific to the probabilistic formulation, which is that we can also make this uncertainty calibrated in the sense that we can show that as the red line contracts to the black line, 
the width of this region of uncertainty around it, so the standard deviation of the GP, contracts at a rate that happens to be a worst case estimate, a relatively tight worst case estimate for how far the red line is from the black line. So that's kind of functionality you're looking for, right? Calibrated uncertainty. So you might ask, okay, um, how have you implemented this? How do you actually do this? Well, in, so in other talks, I might spend more time on this, but here, since I'm among you know, Gaussian process experts, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. I'll just tell you, it's a filter. It's a good old Kalman filter. And so for those of you who know what a Kalman filter is, the next five minutes are going to, or three minutes are going to be boring. And those of you who don't know what Kalman filters are, it's very difficult to explain them in five minutes. So I'll try and keep this very short and just you know, update those of you who know. So Kalman filters are a special subclass, essentially, of Gaussian process models. They are Gaussian process models that are also Markov models. They are, in, are can be described as um, time evolution, or as a Markov chain, um, graphical model of that describes the time evolution of some latent state. The state is like a local memory of the of the Gaussian process that evolves according to some linear stochastic differential equation. I was tempted to say linear time invariant, but that's wrong. It's actually a linear potentially time variant stochastic differential equation. Um, uh, across time, and what we we utilize this framework to describe our ODE solution problem. So just like in Gaussian process regression, you're trying to learn an intractable deterministic function by putting a stochastic process prior, a Gaussian process prior, over that function, and then refining the prior as you evaluate the function. In um, ODE probabilistic ODE solvers, we're trying to find the solution to a deterministic differential equation by modeling its dissolution with the solution of a stochastic linear differential equation, a Gaussian process. And so we choose a particular um, a stochastic differential equation. We say that we have the state space X, which contains several derivatives of the function. In particular, the function itself, its first derivative, and then all the higher order derivatives up to the new derivative, where new is going to be the order roughly of convergence of the ODE solver. And then what the, the way that the inference works is that as the solver steps forward through time, as I just described more vaguely, we are conditioning on the fact that the ODE holds. So that means that the derivative of this uh, curve, the first entry in the state space, is equal to an evaluation of this vector field at the zeroth stage of the state space, so the value of the, of the function itself. Now, um, so this is actually, ideally, this would be a Dirac delta to just say, you know, this, these two things are the same. And that's actually what the ODE, like the deterministic ODE says. And so you can think of this as basically a Gaussian process observation, right? So it's, it's like telling the, ODE, the, the, the GP that the derivative depend, is, is equal to the value of some function at some point. It's like a derivative observation, but there's a little bit of a challenge here, which is that the derivative is actually evaluated at a point so that the number we're providing as an observation is itself an evaluation that depends on the current state of the, of the solution. So it's like a recursive kind of problem. So if f were actually a linear function, then we could do this in closed form, but f isn't linear, so we have to linearize it somehow. And there are parts, like versions of the Kalman filter that do this linearization, they call the extended Kalman filter. And those of you who know about Kalman filters will know about this. If you haven't seen Kalman filters before, the main thing to understand is just like Gaussian process inference involves only linear algebra, Kalman filter inference involves only linear algebra that can also be written as a for loop in the number of data points. So it's a linear in the number of time steps. And so here is the pseudocode for this. You don't have to parse the whole thing. The main thing to notice here is that this is all elementary algebra. There is no call to an optimizer inside of the, of the, um, the algorithm. Okay, so we can implement ODE solvers as Kalman filters. And we can recover the properties of classic ODE solvers, the, like the, the ones that actually matter, not the very specifics down to the minute details, but the, the, of the important properties we can recover um, if we implement these ODE solvers in this way, where we get uncertainty on top of them. Now, so for a while, I used to give this talk, and it was very high of high level, and then I showed some fancy pictures and said, this should all be possible. And then people would say, yeah, OK, fine, keep doing your like, philosophical research, but this is not going to be particularly practical, because we have, we have like solving ODEs is this super efficient scientific task for which there's all this wonderful code. So over the past few years, um, 
many people, including many people from my research group, but also from other groups, have gone out and tried to prove this idea wrong by actually implementing a software package that shows how these solvers can be efficiently implemented. And it's now available, actually. There's also a website for this. I encourage you to have a look at this at, at this website. It's called problem.org. It's a proper package. You can simply tip install it. It's relatively high quality as a community and um, all sorts of tutorials. So please have a look and try out these algorithms for yourself. I also want to convince you just for a few minutes, I'm going to show you a few technical slides to convince you that this is not abstract philosophical research anymore. It's actually quite close to you know, industrial usability, if you like. So here are the results from a recent paper by uh, Nico Kramer in, um, um, and myself on like, the performance of these algorithms as they are now implemented. Here's an example problem. On the top left, you see one of these typical benchmark problems. It's a reduced three-body problem. It's a satellite orbiting between moon and Earth uh, in some centered system of reference, typical kind of ODE benchmark problem. And here we're comparing a classic ODE solver to the probabilistic solver in uh, two different ones. The red one is one of high quality and the gray one is one of slightly lower quality for um, which exist both in the classic and in the probabilistic framework. We compare local error and global error, final time error. You see basically that those two lines are close to the diagonal. So the two algorithms are roughly the same. We're comparing how well these algorithms are calibrated. So in the sense that um, if you give the solver a tolerance, what kind of error does it produce? And you barely notice, but there are actually both the classic and the probabilistic algorithms in here. So they're basically the same. And then um, maybe the most important plots are as a performance in terms of how often we evaluate the vector field. You can see in thin in the background, the classic solvers, and in thick in the front, the, the probabilistic solvers are very similar to each other in performance. And in terms of runtime, ah, they are still like, um, they're, they're still about, uh, you know, one order of magnitude away from each other. So Kevin Murphy is asking a question about the, the NumPy code. I might have to answer this at the end of the talk because I can not directly read the, the comments right now. So that the, the gap between the classic solvers and the, the current NumPy implementation is something like a, maybe one or two orders of magnitude. We actually know where this is coming from. It's a problem of, you know, like super optimizing the code in terms of memory use. Um, I'm not going to tell you how to fix that, but instead I'm going to try and convince you otherwise that this gap doesn't really matter anymore. Um, because so here is another plot, another of my PhD students, Nathaniel Bosch, implemented these solvers also in Julia. And what you see here in this plot is a runtime comparison as a function of the error that the algorithm had makes. So clearly, if you make low error, you have to pay more time, right? Um, you see these kind of work precision diagrams for many different solvers in many different languages, actually, across language. Like, ecosystems. Here at the top in gray is MATLAB, in green is SciPy, in blue is old Fortran code by Ernst Heira, and professional C++ code, and then down here are these super optimized Julia libraries, and the yellow, big yellow line is the probabilistic solvers when implemented in Julia. So they're still slower in Julia than the, the efficient code in Julia for the classic solvers, but they're as good as in runtime as the other solvers. So if you're the kind of person who doesn't care about the, the gain you get from moving from, from Python to Julia, then you shouldn't care about moving from non-probabilistic to probabilistic. OK, so thanks a lot, Faye. This, sounds, this is very exciting to hear. So um, maybe one final plot, and then I'll end with this stupid technical details. These solvers can actually also be calibrated. So classic ODE solvers, they adapt their step size as they move through the simulation. They slow down when the problem gets hard, and then they speed up again when the problem is easy. We can do that as well, and we can use this process to calibrate the width of the uncertainty as the solver moves through time. Here is a, a plot of a paper that was in AI Stats two years ago or one year ago. Well, it's the yeah one AI Stats before the current AI Stats. Um, it's one of these plots where we do several different things to improve the method from top left to bottom right. The main plot is to one is to look at the one at the, at the bottom right, where we show error versus estimated error in a chi-square statistic. So it's relative to the distribution of the square of a Gaussian random variable. The green region is the bit you want to be in. That's the, the range that a random variable that is Gaussian distributed should be in. And you can see that these solvers are roughly there. So they are also doing this probabilistic thing, this estimating the uncertainty in a meaningful way. OK, so now I want to use the final few minutes to convince you that this is actually an interesting thing to do. So it used, I, I used to think when I started work on this that um, 
if once we had these kind of plots, we'd be done and everyone would be keen to use these methods, right? Because what, what else would you want, right? Calibrated uncertainty. That's kind of maybe what a Gaussian process person would also think. If I think you can just get the GP to get the right uncertainty, then you're done. But it turns out that just providing uncertainty is maybe not enough. We have to convince people that it's actually also useful for something. And that's what I'd like to do now. So um, I, and in fact, maybe one part of the problem is that when people call ODE solvers, they tend to run it in this kind of regime where you're so high precision that the uncertainty doesn't really matter anymore. So let me return to this example that I made at the beginning with this uh, SIR pandemic model um, to, to solve. So um, this is an example of what you might call an inverse problem if you're more from a, from a say, numerical analysis or applied mathematics kind of background. So in, here's my pedestrian version of explaining what an inverse problem is. A forward problem is a case where you know what the ODE is and you hand it to a piece of code and ask the code to compute the path of the dynamical system. So here's the ODE, what's the solution of the ODE? An inverse problem is the inverse thing. So I give you the solution path, I show you the trajectory of a dynamical system, and I'd like to know what the parameters of the ODE were, what kind of equation have we been solving? So the, the, the reason why it's called forward and inverse is that in the classic numerical analysis perspective, there is a black box in the middle that's called the ODE solver, and you'd like to fix either the output of it or the input of it. Now that I just now that I just showed you that an ODE solver is actually a Gaussian process inference method, maybe it's more natural to say, well, this is like the inverse problem is like trying to learn the hyperparameters of a Gaussian process model, and the forward problem is like predicting the 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 ODE the, the, the posterior of a Gaussian process. Now, as Gaussian process experts, you know that those two things are not they're not fundamentally separated from each other. One is like a hierarchical Bayesian version of the other. So wouldn't it be nice if we could write programs that take this mechanistic information that there is an ODE with unknown parameters and also that we have some data which is maybe also measured with noise to combine both of these sources of information together such that we can actually let me show you the other slide right that we can solve problems like this. So I give you data that says the curve some is somewhat related to these numbers that have been computed or has been collected by the authorities obviously also with noise. So for example you see this silly weekly pattern in the German uh, data set because Germans don't work on the weekend. And um, similarly, there are these parameters in that ODE that we also don't know. And we'd like to infer what the true curve underneath was for all of these states in the system, even those that we can't directly observe. So once you phrase the problem like this, and you know that the ODE solver is actually a, a, a Kalman filter, it's very natural to just extend the state space. So I showed you this slide before. So you can think of an ODE solver as writing down a Gauss Markov model, and then at, at particular points in time, conditioning on the fact that we know that the ODE holds at that point. Now we could also take that same Markov chain and condition on the fact that we know that the curve went through certain points, right? If you observe that the, the system has you know, the, that there were certain infection counts, for example. That's a linear map, linear projection of the underlying state space, the, in particular, the I uh, part of the, of the compartmental model. And we can use those informa this information from the data to inform us about other quantities that we don't know, this beta parameter. So we could say beta also changes through time, and it's another part of a state space. We just add it to the state space of the ODE solver and say, let's infer that vectors, uh, that this, this maybe also time varying function across time by observing these different sources of information and conditioning on all of them as we go along. So um, we did that in a recent, in a paper that was in New Rips this year, uh, in a paper with uh, Jonathan Schmidt and Nico Kremer. And here is a, a plot from that paper that I'm going to try and explain to you. And this gives my argument for why this is a good thing to do. The classic, actually, maybe I should tell you that story first, and then it's slightly going to break what I'm going to say at the end, but I'll show you that story first. How do we classically solve such problems, actually? So let me show you a, a tutorial on how to solve such inverse problems from NumPyro. Um, this is a team that I think Zubin at some point also used to work with. It's a wonderful piece of code, so I'm not trying to diss it at all. I say it's really just a state-of-the-art probabilistic programming. Here's a tutorial from them. This is a predator frame model, so it's a Lotka Volterra type model. Uh, hares and, and foxes trying to eat them. And 
you, so here's a similar system where you observe the dynamics of the system. You would like to know what the parameters are. And so here's code for how to solve this in, uh, in non-Pyro. I actually not, I mean, you can actually kind of parse this even if you don't know about Pyro, you can just kind of look at it and see what's going on. The exciting thing is that there is a model that draws from the prior and then forward solves the ODE. That's what happens here. So there's a forward solve involved. And this, what does this thing actually call? Well, it calls ODE in. So what's ODE in? Oh, it comes from JAX actually. Ah, nice. So here's the corresponding JAX code. Um, by, uh, you know, you don't have to read the whole thing. The important thing is that this code implements the dormant prince method. So it's this four five type classic ODE solver that is essentially with some caveats, a Kalman filter without uncertainty, right? So what this, the important bit about this is that this, sol that this way of solving this problem involves repeatedly forward solving. So it's actually a double loop. There is an outer loop that calls the ODE solver. That's pretty much this loop here. I mean, calls to this function. And then inside of this piece of code, hidden is another for loop, a Kalman filter that moves forward. And every computer scientist knows that nested for loops are not a great thing. And if you can avoid them, that's convenient. So I'm going to show you, I'm returning to my samples, how you can solve this double loop problem in a single loop by conditioning on both sources of information at the same time. So what you see here in this, in, in this plot at the top, the bottom green thing is not going to be important. I couldn't in the time fix these slides to make, make it go away. The, the, the yellow thing at the top is the predicted path of the infectious count. And the red thing is an estimate for this unknown quantity beta, this the contact rates, how often people interact with each other and therefore how quickly they move from one group to the next. So this is the state at the beginning of the solver. It hasn't done anything yet. We are yet to condition on this black set of data that we haven't observed yet. Now, as the solver moves forward through time, you can think of a Kalman filter moving through the data set. And everywhere where there's no data point, it just conditions on the ODE being holding, right? And the ODE involves an unknown quantity beta for which we just linearize and map Gaussian process uncertainty through it. And we retain a Gaussian process prior for this beta parameters for this red thing here in the middle. So as we now move forward, initially we, we know we learn very little about this contact rate because there are basically no cases yet in Germany at that point early on in 2020. And if there are no infectious people that don't infect other people, then you can't figure out how often people meet through this model. But then as the number of cases rises over, over the first wave, we notice that the, 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 the wave doesn't actually exponentially grow as people initially thought, right? But that we've managed to flatten the curve. And the only explanation for this within this probabilistic model is that the contact rate had to go down. So now we become informed about the contact rate. And then we can, you know, I'll let this thing run to the end. You can, so, you can see this solver now moves through the whole data set. Then there was a phase in the, in the summer of 2020 when the cases in Germany went down a lot. Um, during that uh, uh, phase, again, you have little contact. So if people don't meet each other, if there are no, not many, sorry, if people meet, met each other, but if there's not many cases, you can't use them to learn about the contact rate. So the contact, the, the estimate for the contact rate becomes uncertain again. Then we have a second and third and fourth wave, and we become more confident again about what the contact rate is. This is all a single forward pass, a single pa Kalman filter pass forward that has basically inferred the whole thing already. It has inferred the latent quantity, the ODE. And at the very end, it can also predict forward through time because now there's no more data. We just solve the ODE forward through time and we get an estimate. You can also do a backwards pass, a smoother pass, and then you get samples from this process that look like this. So running this kind of code on a laptop like mine takes about one and a half minutes. If you run the corresponding code in a, one of these probabilistic programming languages, it takes easily a day. Not because probabilistic inference is somehow smarter and faster, well, maybe, maybe smarter, but it's certainly not faster than classic point estimation. In fact, it's more expensive, slightly more expensive, but because we're saving one loop, we're getting rid of an entire loop that is just caused by what I would argue is um, unnecessary compartmentalization of the algorithms. Just thinking of the numerical algorithm as a black box without realizing that it's actually itself part of the learning machine and can be directly incorporated. I want to finally like, briefly end on um, a more recent work that to, to, to dampen this a little bit, um, but also to make it more directly connected to Gaussian process inference. So here's recent work that just went on the, on the archive uh, a week ago or so. 
um, by Philip Tornard, a postdoc in my group, and Nathanael Bosch, who you've uh, heard about before, on how to deal, how to set up basically the same thing if you're not trying to infer a time varying non parametric object, but a simple parametric set of parameters. So here's another SIR model, but a very much simpler one, where we, there's just two parameters that we don't know, so we'd like to infer them. Um, so we have a data set that looks like this. You can imagine that if you, if you are unlucky with your data set, then the setup I just showed you in the last few slides is not going to work well uh, because you'll initially get to just see the ODE, right? And there is this unknown parameter that you never learn about. So this ODE has, will have to do something and the linearization will be at the wrong point, basically. And then when you observe the, the data eventually, that the system is like the, the mean of the Gaussian process is basically too far away from the truth. And then you can't really fit on it anymore. So instead, in such settings, instead, you want to really think of this as Gaussian process hyperparameter inference. And it turns out it's possible to do that. So if you have an ODE system that has a, like a finite set of parameters that are unknown, and you have an initial value problem, you make observations of the trajectory of that system that are noisy, then what you'd ideally like to do is to say, I want to know the uh, 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 likelihood for this unknown parameter theta well, what is that likelihood? Well, it's, it's a marginal over the observation likelihood, which depends on the true solution of the ODE. And then I just want to marginalize over the fact that the solution of the ODE is the solution of the ODE. But because we, we don't know what the solution of the ODE is, we can't like, integrate over this Dirac delta. So instead, we approximate it with an approximation to a Dirac delta that is given by an ODE solver. It turns out you can do this formally very precisely, and Philip tells you exactly how to do that. And then you really get a Gaussian process model. So a forward backward run of a Kalman uh, smoother and, and filter and smoother gives you a Gaussian process model that you can then just condition on the data and you get a gradient uh, by auto differentiation of the likelihood of this, uh, of, of this model and you can optimize for it. And then you get the same kind of behavior that you know from Gaussian process models that they can actually use the observation noise to simplify the inference problem so that you kind of, you get uh, you can sort of uh, regularize the problem away by increasing observation noise for a while and then hit a good, a good point. So if you'd like to know, the reason I'm showing this, this slide at the end is just, if you'd like to know more about how to do inverse problems inference, not on non-parametric objects, but on just a small finite set of parameters, then this is the right algorithm rather than the one I showed you before. So with that, I'm at the end. Um, I'm briefly going to summarize, and then I'll try and finally read the, the comments that uh, Kevin and others have, have written that I couldn't yet see. Um, so what I wanted to get across is that computation is inference, not just optimization of expensive black box algorithms, but actually all numerical computation is inference. And if you are an expert on building probabilistic inference methods that run efficiently for complicated functions, with non-trivial observation models like observing gradients, observing integrals, and um, like building ex expressive priors, then you are exactly the right expert to build numerical algorithms as well. And you can extend your knowledge from, you know, Bayesian optimization in specific to basically all computation. So, um, in particular, I showed an example of probabilistic ODE solvers, where I showed that these algorithms, they, they are Gaussian process models that match the performance of classic algorithms. They're very close in computational cost by now. They provide calibrated adaptive uncertainty and can be combined with other sources of information to break the separation between forward and inverse problems. So thinking about computation as inference provides new valuable functionality that can actually save computational cost. All right, so instead of showing you where to look for, my, for our publications, let me finally read the, the messages that came in during, during the call. Um, aha, now there's more and more coming. Okay, so Kevin Murphy asked that you notice that all the pop-down code codes uh, seems pure NumPy. Uh, you're completely right. And we had a long discussion in the community about how we want to do autodiff. And it seems like JAX may be the solution. I've been pushing for JAX for a while. Um, there are others who wanted to do it in a different way, and there are all other design questions, but you're making a very good point. Um, making that a, good, a Google Summer of Code thing would be wonderful. So um, let me send you an email. <laughs> um, do you think there is a significant benefit to using improvements on EKF or UKF? So, so we have actually written papers in the past, in particular Hans Kersting and Philip Tornard had papers on 
using unscented Kalman filters and also particle filters for this kind of model. There's actually a kind of an overview paper by, let me go to the corresponding slide, by Philip Tronarp. Um, this is this one, 2019, Tronarp casting Zach Hennig on just a filtering view on inference. And actually the framework, as I described this here, is um, actually, where is a good slide for this? is pretty much just phrased in terms of any filter. And then you can just have an observation model that works with an uncentered Kalman filter or uh, an extended Kalman filter. Uh, Faye, okay, you've raised your hand. Oh, uh, maybe you should go through the list of questions I'll ask after you finish. Okay, uh, good. Yeah. So, um, okay, this the question I don't understand. <laughs> Um, how easy is it to modify these algorithms to solve steady state PDEs? Ah, wonderful, good that you asked. So let me show you this slide. This is from a, a paper that is uh, currently on the archive on that actually solves an, an, a, a PDE. There's another paper that will be in AI stats this year called the probabilistic method of lines, which is also solving PDEs. So here the idea, this is a very, it's a relatively simple way of going from ODEs to PDEs, which is saying, think of a time varying PDE as a, ODE model where the state space consists of the grid of an ODE, uh, uh, of a PDE solver through and through, going through time. And actually, it's interesting, it's an, there's an interesting contribution in this. It's not, not just doing like the knee jerk thing, which is that if you read the method of lines paper that was in, is in, in AI stats, um, or actually, it's the method of lines paper in your words. Uh, yeah, okay. They probably think method of lines. They try and look up that string. The, the cool thing about this is that if you if you describe both the probabilistic inference over the PDE grid, which is itself a, a GP solve, and the evolution through time in this this GP language, then you can you can quantify the uncertainty arising both from the discretization error in space and the discretization error in time in a, in a combined framework, and that means you can calibrate where you spend your computational resources. So do you rather uh, take big steps of the ODE solver and have a finer grid a long time or have a coarser grid a long space and a finer grid a long time. There's a way of like trading those off properly with each other in this kind of uh, description. Okay, so maybe final question. Are these methods able to recover existing backward error estimates for classic numerical problems? So uh, yes and no. So there is a very technical paper by Hans Kersting um, if you, so I'm eh, not sure I have a link to it, um, on error analysis for probabilistic ODE solvers or filter type ODE solvers that tries to really nail down the math very precisely on this, this kind of error estimation, forward and backward. And I'm, I should really just say, read that paper because I'm, I'm as actually involved in co-writing it, but I had a really hard time following the mathematicians as they were doing their proofs there, doing properly showing properties of ODE solvers that if you want to convince a mathematical uh, audience is, is a very technical business because ODEs are a very long studied domain. And so I'm tempted to say, yes, there is, but that maybe you have to wait for the proper technical answer either to read that paper by Hans Kersting or to me, since I'm showing that slide at the moment, there's a book coming out, Probabilistic Numerics, Computation as Machine Learning, by uh, myself and Hans and Mike Osborne. Uh, this year, we're, we're currently working on the copy editing for it. So it's hopefully going to be out by April or so. Um, and that has a long chapter on analysis of ODE filters. Okay, so I think I've gone through the papers apart, apart from the question that, oh, there was a, there was a comment to face. So maybe that's not actually a question. So, um... It's a great talk. It's really exciting to see. They're really interesting, especially we just read your paper and now I remember the paper title. So can I have a question about, this is a really nice way of thinking, how would you combine information um, um, of a mechanistic knowledge? But when you do posterior sampling, since you have sampled edge step, you're not guaranteed to sample the trajectory when you piece them up, actually follow the equation. So you may not get a valid vector field out of the posterior. And when you say calibrated uncertainty, it's a bit of a tricky when you calibrate against what probabilistic measure, on the whole structure trajectory or just every step? So, uh, so, so I mean, when I say calibrated, I mean a relatively simple thing, which is that yeah. the, um, 
well, I basically, I actually, I mean, I, technically, I really mean, let me show you this slide, this slide again. Um, I really mean a plot like this that says mm -hmm. the error estimate, the local error estimate of the ODE solver is with, is matches approximately the distance between the point estimate and the true, uh, true uh, solution. Now, mm -hmm. it's, of course, it doesn't match it perfectly. It can't. If it could, we could just subtract one from the other and then we'd be done, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. there, will, there will necessarily have to be some like, uh, gap between the true mm -hmm. solution and even estimates. And you're right that there, there is, a, uh, is also a structural mismatch in the mm -hmm. sense that these, uh, and, and actually Gaussian process experts, again, are the ideal people to discuss this with, as you, you all know, Samples yeah. from a Gaussian process come from some space that isn't actually yeah. the RKHS of the kernel, and so so there is there is a separation between the 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 true solution of the ODE and both the posterior mean and the samples. However, yeah. let me add mm -hmm. like two positive things on this. Mm -hmm. The first thing is there's a the, the, because it's an ODE solver, it has the nice property that if you increase the budget for it, mm -hmm. that error will become smaller and smaller. So if mm -hmm. you really want it to be zero, you can. You know, you can make that Dirac delta into this approximate Dirac delta into an actual delta by just increasing the number of steps you give to the solver to a very large number. Mm -hmm. So this is actually my follow-up question now. Uh, given that structure discrepancy in modeling bias, right? So suppose right now you're showing a very nice example saying, you know, I'll give you the deterministic form of the ODE. The only thing I'll know is the parameter beta t. Now suppose there is uncertain about the structure form. So essentially, you, are, you have to put a prior on the latent structure of the OD. Then do you think there is hope um, to, to extend this knowledge, sort of doing both the scientific equation discovery, so to speak, and, and doing this online future? So I'll, I'll give two answers to this. The first one is my cop out on. If you, if you pressed me on saying something that we've done, like if, I, if you want me to sell some stuff we've done, let me show another paper from, from my backup. This is a paper that is in AI Stats this year, the new one, the 2022 one. It's called Mix and Match Operators for uh, mm -hmm. ODE Solvers. So if you have additional structural information, algebraic information, for example, if you know that your system is, has a Hamiltonian, it conserves some quantity. If you know that your system is a second order differential equation, that, and, and so on and so on, then you can include this additional information as a third source of information into the ODE solver mm -hmm. and linearize like, cor like in the correct way into an extended Kalman filter and get this. So what you see here in this plot, just visually black is a Hanon Heiler system, black is the true solution. In green is what you get if you run an ODE, like one of our probabilistic ODE solvers at low precision. And you look, you see it's kind of, you know, it's, it's a bit off. And if you mm -hmm. condition on conserved energy, you get this thing, this golden thing here on the right. Mm -hmm. But I actually let, let me also give you a more uh, maybe motivating answer to this, this community. So this, the problem you just raised is you could face the same question in the classic setting of regression, right? If I'm doing Gaussian process regression, I'm trying to learn a function and I know something about that function, are you able to incorporate this information in your Gaussian process prior? It's basically yeah. the exact same thing. So yeah. in this community, people who know about Gaussian processes can now actually maybe think about simulation problems and optimization mm -hmm. problems and integration problems as well. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Philip. Um, this is, uh, yeah, I think this is like a really interesting and um, like, um, I mean, interesting view on like how we can view like Gaussian like we will come in filters as Gaussian processes and potentially more different um, like numerical methods uh, in a similar way. Uh, so I was just wondering, like for the, uh, maybe you mentioned earlier in uh, phase uh, questions, but if we have uh, some priors on those hyperparameters or like, um, or certain like variables, um, like up in the hierarchy, uh, the, Uncertainty eventually will depend on these um, these priors, right? For scientists uh, who are using these methods, how do they find a bridge that connects the meanings of those priors to like the uncertainty that they can potentially integrate for their work? So um, here I have, I mean, this is I would I would say this isn't directly my my field of work, but let me pick up this like maybe try and formalize it a little bit uh, nevertheless. So 
Um, I showed you very briefly the slide, and I apologize that I did this very quickly because I was running out of time at the end. What I was trying to argue there is that it's possible to really think of inference on and the unknown parameters of a, of a, of a like dynamical system by computing a likelihood for the unknown parameters under the observed data by marginalizing out the effect of the numerical solver because the numerical solver actually produces a Gaussian process. It's the same way, right, that you can do inference on a Gaussian process model by marginalizing out the Gaussian process because it's a closed form integral. It's just, it's maybe a more, you know, elaborate 2022 way of doing Gaussian process inf inference by using a, like, a much more complicated Gaussian process model or one that is made more, more wrapped around a few corners. And um, once, of course, you have such a likelihood, you can then multiply it with whatever prior you might have and get a posterior. And I'm not telling you how to choose that prior because the scientists should do that. Now, I know that people who do scientific inference, you know, to make you know, images of black holes and so on have very elaborate priors that they spend a lot of time trying to get exactly right. So that shouldn't be the task of the pe people inventing the algorithms. But one nice thing about these methods is that you, you, you actually can check what the effect is of the, is of the numerical computation in between. It creates a small disturbance, which we can quantify because the solvers are calibrated. And you can say how far this estimate for the likelihood is from what the truth might be, right? Up to some you know, Gaussian disturbance that, that is actually quantified. So we can, if, if you now have a prior and you would like to say how, which, to which precision does the solver have to run so that we are sure that we actually get a posterior that is close to the true posterior, then modulo getting all the algorithms actually right, you can like, do it this way, in a formally meaningful way, rather than having to you know, eyeball and just hope that things work. Sorry, that was a long answer. Kevin, you also had a question. Oh yeah, I, I know we're at time, but so you focus a lot on sort of scientific applications and putting probabilistic ML to help science, but what about sort of more classic deep learning things like if neural ODEs, for example, I think my I don't know much about this area, but I believe people use off-the-shelf solvers there. Do you think there's gains to to you know nest everything? So you've got probabilistic ML inside of your neural ODE solver, which is then perhaps then powering something else. Is it worth um, it? I could see so, potentially it would save compute, but I don't know if it's worth it. Uh, yes. So here I'm I'm just going to. Uh, uh, be, a, be a good scientist and just say, I'm, I'm not going to talk about it because we haven't done it yet. I can tell you that this is a very interesting question and we are definitely interested in addressing this further. There are ongoing projects. I mean, maybe other people might want to do that themselves as well, um, but we don't have sufficient results that I could just claim anything. But of course, yeah, I, I think it usually when you're using an ODE solver somewhere, if you think hard about what you want to do with it, you'll realize that there is, are some quantities that you know, some, some sources of error for which you would like to have a structured, structured estimate rather than, uh, you know, just, just one big error bar that goes over the whole thing. Just like Gaussian process regression provides a more elaborate posterior uncertainty than the kind of error bars you might get from kernel rich regression. And whenever that is the case, then you might be interested in applying these kind of tools. Yeah, thanks. But yeah, so that's not really an answer because we don't really have one yet. But you're raising a very good point. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, uh, Philip, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, so the, uh, the recording will be available on the calendar and uh, we'll also be working on the YouTube release. Um, and I think that will conclude uh, this particular session, but feel free to reach out to Philip if you have more questions. Thank you everyone for your time.